Most people see a vast emptiness in oceans. They seem to divide us, but in fact, they connect us. Since ancient times, oceans carry people, cultures, religions, and goods to the ends of the earth and created new worlds. I'm Sam Willis, a maritime historian. I'm traveling an old sea route in the wake of a great Chinese fleet. I love the collision between old and new, it's fantastic. On giant wooden ships, they sailed bound for the western seas, a journey of over 50,000 kilometers. The fleet followed the trade route that has come to be known as the Maritime Silk Road. It's an amazing discovery and laid the groundwork for how we live today. A world shaped and bound together by trade, where people of vastly different cultures, languages, and faiths find common ground in mutual self interest. In the last leg of my journey, I'm traveling to Africa to discover traces left by the Chinese fleet. It's such an important piece of history. Then through the Suez Canal, north to Europe. Eastern Europe, Western Europe. And this is where it ends up. To see how maritime trade still drives our modern world. oceans have set the stage for great voyages of discovery and the making of great fortunes and in their wake they have always brought other things including religion take Christianity it began in the Middle East and wherever it spread, converts made its rituals their own. The kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And centuries later, it has become the faith of millions. Almost 50% of Africans today identify themselves as Christians, and many of them are devout. In some sub-Saharan countries, as many as four-fifths of the population attend church regularly. You'd be forgiven for thinking we're in Africa. But in fact, this is Guangzhou, China. In the last couple of decades, thousands of Africans have come to China in search of opportunities, and at least 100,000 have come here to Guangzhou. And something that the Chinese call special economic zone status has allowed foreigners to live and work here. These zones were established to boost trade with attractive incentives for foreigners. And with that came new ideas, cultures, and religions. It was an experiment in globalization and it transformed the city. This international exchange is visible here in downtown Guangzhou, China's little Africa. I'm here to explore how the city's open trade policy continues to bring people here from halfway across the world and what makes them stay. <laughs> Nativa Boyoka is from the Congo, but has lived in China for the last six years. She makes a living selling cosmetics. When I finished university, I asked my father if he could help me to leave the country. Because I wanted to see how things are going on outside of my country. When I introduced 
mon passeport à l'ambassade de Chine, j'ai eu le visa facilement. Mm -hmm. Et je suis arrivée ici. Natiba knew no one here except her sister. But these days, she's made friends and settled down to life in this once strange land. Does he work, work with you? Yeah, he works in my shop. He helps me to make the glass to class my products. Oh, OK. Me help. When you go back to Africa, do you miss China? La Chine me manque parce que quand je rentre maintenant mon pays, je, je me retrouve comme une étrangère. Maintenant, je suis comme une chinoise. Je me sens en place. <laughs> oui, c'est ça. Natiba's experience has shown me how Guangzhou's openness attracts newcomers, builds relationships with locals, and in turn transforms the city. But the story of how trade draws vibrant populations is nothing new. Guangzhou first began to thrive as a diverse city 1,300 years ago, as China's only port open to foreign traders. And if trade influences migration, well, migration also influences culture. The first time I saw this drum, I think the sound is amazing. Yeah. And it looks very beautiful. And after I study about uh, the African music, it's very incredible. It's all from their hearts. Music and rhythm is a very good way to enjoy. A djembe has become a very popular instrument. Now for my own induction into the joys of this drum. Three basic sounds of djembe. Mm -hmm. One is bass. In the center of the drum. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, close with your hand yep. and hit, the, hit this phrase. Mm -hmm. That's the second sound of jimbe. Okay. And when you relax your hand, you will get a very high huh. pitch. together. It might seem like a bizarre trend that the djembe, a hand drum that originated in 14th century Africa, is now being celebrated in China. But coastal cities have traditionally been early adopters of new ideas from abroad. years ago, their relationship blossomed to an unprecedented level when the Ming court was presented with emissaries from Africa. Around the year 1415, ambassadors from an East African city-state called Marlin reached the court of the Emperor Yongle. Yongle was an outward-looking emperor who ordered Admiral Zheng He to set sail on trading missions, bound for Asia and the Middle East aboard a fleet of giant treasure ships. And on December 28, 1416, he gave Zheng He new orders to take the envoys back to their homeland. Half a year later, the fleet set off on their longest voyage to date facing deadly monsoons with mighty gales that threatened their passage west to the fabled shores of Africa.
The great treasure fleet of the Ming Emperor Yongle, composed of the largest ships of its age, set sail from China in 1417. They journeyed over 10,000 kilometers to reach these shores, Africa's eastern coastline. An area that was part of an extensive maritime trade network that spanned the Indian Ocean. Now this coastline belongs to Kenya and Somalia, but 600 years ago, trading ports lined this coast, ruled by Arab sheikhs and populated with a microcosm of Asia. Indians, Persians, even Indonesians migrated here to trade. Not many details are known of what happened when the treasure fleet arrived. In fact, there's no physical evidence to confirm Zhang He and his men actually reached here at all. But I'm looking for what brought merchants here, and the market in the town of Melindi is a good place to start. these streets 600 years ago, there'd have been a wash with luxury goods from the African interior. Gold from the mines of the country we now know as Zimbabwe, ivory, rhino, horn, tortoise shell, ambergris, and of course, slaves. And they'd have been just one part of a very diverse stream of humanity. These bazaars were the meeting point of continents. It would have been quite a sight. And this mashup gave rise to something amazing an entirely new language and culture. Over nine centuries, indigenous African, Arab, and Indian traditions merged to form Swahili, a name which actually comes from the Arabic word for coast. Melindi's international heritage reflects how it was an important trading hub, so important that they sent out ambassadors on diplomatic missions. But what happened when the Chinese treasure ships arrived is not well understood. In the official Ming Dynasty records, it simply says that this place is an extremely long way from China, and they don't offer any other information about the subject. I'm trying to find a curious monument. These are great, but it's not these. Ah, here it is. Right, this is called a pillar tomb. It was named for its shape. It was believed to work as a sort of transmitter. Holy men were buried here, and this was like a, a conduit for their spiritual power long after their life had ended. And often, they're decorated with beautiful ceramics like the jewels in a crown. This porcelain dates back to the 16th century, a century after the time of Zheng He. But its use on a holy tomb shows how medieval China became a small part of the local culture, along with Arabia and India. None of this really proves that the treasure fleet visited here, but what I haven't found on land, I just might find underwater. Off these shores lie at least 30 sunken ships that are centuries old. If one of them is a Chinese treasure ship, it would prove once and for all that the Ming Emperor's trade mission made it here.
sees a beta is Kenya's one and only underwater archaeologist. He's taking me to what he believes could be one of Kenya's oldest wrecks. This was discovered by a local fisherman. So when they go every day to fish, to collect, you know, lobsters and all that, they found the shipwreck and they came to tell us about it. So you can imagine the excitement. Yes, this is it. It's a very narrow channel between two sandbars here. Hope we don't run aground. Some people might imagine that shipwrecks happen on the open sea, but most actually occur within sight of shore. Zebado! Huh? You're almost there. Okay. Yeah, he's there. You're almost there. But finding a wreck is a bit like finding the proverbial needle in a haystack. So stage one is trying to find the wreck. Again, uh, there should be a boy marking it, but we can't find the boy. Find the boy, find the wreck. Yeah, yeah these are sites. Where's the boy gone? Is it? You see, the sea, the guy was cut it. You know, you put it here and local fishers take it away. We found it. Some local fishermen have uh, removed the boy. Shut up. We found it. We're right above the wreck site now. You can see these two huge heads of coral, which the ship must have hit to make it sink. Oh, I can't wait to get in. I'm searching for the remains of a 600-year-old Chinese treasure ship off the coast of Kenya, hoping to find evidence of an imperial maritime expedition. First, I find some porcelain. And then we find what seems to be part of the ship's structure. That piece of wood that we were excavating, which part of the hole did that come from? This one, the ribs. Ah, okay. It's a, it's, it's a rib. Holding it up like a wine glass. Yeah, they're very thick. So that tells you that the tradition of the shipwreck is very ancient because as we move to the modern times, the, the timber tended to get, to get smaller. Mm. But archaeology isn't the only kind of evidence out there. I'm travelling from Malindi, 160 kilometres up the coast, to meet a family that might be able to offer a lead about the Chinese fleet on the island of Pate. And it all comes down to a local legend. Hundreds of years ago, some Chinese sailors were stranded here after a shipwreck. Now, the local inhabitants, as you might expect, are descended from African, Indian and Arab ancestors. But some of them also have Chinese heritage. Jambo. Yeah. 
So I've heard a story that you've got Chinese blood in your veins. Baraka Badiche's family law tells how she's descended from a Chinese castaway. The story comes with proof of sorts, an heirloom she believes is an old Chinese teacup. That's magical. Baraka tells me how, in 2005, Chinese researchers tested her DNA and told her she was part Chinese, which of course also affects her own children. How does that make you feel? Are you, are you quite proud to be part Chinese, to be a bit different? Why not? <laughs> I'm proud. We are Hmong from Chinese blood. Yeah. So we are happy. Are you now famous in the village? Yeah. Famous. Other people, ah, Chinese. <laughs> Even my sons, they ask, why, Chinese, come, come. <laughs> That's brilliant. It's clear that some of the islanders feel a connection to the legend of Chinese mariners from long ago. And the island holds another tantalizing clue, dating back to the time of the great treasure fleet some 600 years ago. The ruins that dot Pate Island are the remains of a medieval civilization. The settlement itself was called Shanga, and some believe that that's a corruption of the word China itself. Others, that it's simply just a shortened version of the name for that ancient Chinese port, Shanghai. I'm meeting a local resident and amateur historian, Mansur Ilayatvan, who's taking me to a special spot with an intriguing tale. Our island is it's having very interesting history. One of the very oldest man, he told me, my son, long time ago here, there was a Chinese ships, and one of the ships was capsized. All the, this area, if we try to walk, we will see some little pieces. OK. Yeah. So I'm looking for some pieces of Chinese pottery. And, and, and this is <laughs> no the one. Way. Yeah. I didn't believe him. I didn't believe him. But it's true. Oh, my god, that's amazing. Uh, that's, look, there's more. Yeah, we still have more. You got a piece? Yes. He said that it was all kind of broken up and littered around in this mangrove, and I just, I was a bit suspicious. But um, I've been here less than a minute. And there are still pieces inside the water. Here we go. Why is all this here, do you think? Is this a channel that leads to the sea? Yeah, this is a channel. There was, there was no mango before here, but they started uh -huh. to grow now, yeah. So this, may, this used to be the shoreline? Yeah, the shoreline. Right. What do your friends think about you collecting this My old horse. Yesterday I thought I'm crazy to collect this, this thing, but I, I'm telling them I'm very interested. You're not crazy, you're not crazy, my friend. Yeah. It's true, it's true. Yeah, it's true. This is genuinely the most amazing thing I've ever done as a historian or archaeologist. And with all of these pieces of Chinese pottery, I just feel so close to that Chinese treasure fleet. What I've seen is compelling evidence that the Chinese treasure fleet reached these lands. But what's certain is that African goods reached China. The Great Fleet made three voyages to Africa, and each time they brought back with them ostriches, zebras, lions. But most of all, the animal that caused the greatest astonishment was what the Chinese called Qi Lin, but we call giraffe. The Chi Lin has two forefeet, which are more than nine chur high. The head is carried on a long neck, which is one chang six chur long. Well, if the Africans really wanted to impress the Chinese, they simply couldn't have chosen a better animal. The giraffe resembled a mythical creature of Chinese lore, 
taken as heaven's approval for Zheng He's mission. But earthly politics would decide the great treasure fleet's future. In 1424, the Emperor Yong Le, the great patron of the expeditions, died. The hundred-strong Imperial treasure fleet was decommissioned after its seventh voyage. While merchant ships still sailed these routes, the glorious age of state-sanctioned Chinese exploration was over. Less than a century later, the first Europeans would begin sailing east. This is the Vasco da Gama Pillar, named after the famous Portuguese explorer who was the first European to sail around the Cape of Good Hope at the bottom of Africa and to go on to reach India. The Portuguese were to claim a foothold in the Indian Ocean for 500 years, and they brought their religion with them. The Portuguese had established a trading post here to act as a resting station for Portuguese ships on their way to India. Notice the cross at the top. It's a symbol of the new motivation for these European explorers in these seas that had never seen them before. I've traveled from China, through Southeast Asia, to India, the Middle East, and Africa, tracing the passages of the old maritime Silk Road. Next, I'm exploring how today's giant trade ships ferry goods between East and West and how a game-changing engineering feat spurred a rebirth of maritime trade. Now, of course, we have the Suez Canal. Every year, 17,000 ships, a tenth of the world's sea trade, passes through here, carrying over 300 million tons of goods. A 200-kilometer shortcut through the desert, the canal shaves nearly 9,000 kilometers and 14 days off the journey between east and west. It took a decade to build and was opened in 1869 when it measured barely eight meters deep and in parts just 22 meters wide. Over the years, as the world's ships got bigger, the canal was upgraded until its most ambitious expansion yet. In 2015, a second 35 kilometer long channel was opened to bring the canal into the 21st century. Tarek Hassan was part of the team responsible for the monumental upgrade. In the last four years, we began to notice a large increase in vessels, especially container ships. In numbers or in size? In size. Massive new ships needed a massive new channel. We used 45 dredgers from different companies along the world. These dredgers represent about 75% of the world uh, dredging capacity. That's amazing, they were all here. How long did it take? Just one year. One year? Over 250 million cubic meters of sand was removed to dig the new channel. It can now fit the biggest ships in the world and increased capacity from 78 vessels a day to 96. 
You know, I've never been anywhere quite like this. It's hot, it's windy, it's dusty, and yet here you are. We have these enormous ships sailing by. It's like we're in the center of our clockwork world, bearing witness to how modern society ticks along. A hundred and fifty years since its construction, the new Suez Canal is a crucial focal point of world shipping, linking Asia to Europe as never before. But to understand just how important the upgrade was, I'm travelling northwards. as the gateway to Europe. This is the port of Piraeus, the gateway to Athens in Greece. And it was said that in ancient times you could get anything you wanted at the port of Piraeus. And looking at all of these containers here now, I think the same can be said of today. 2,500 years ago, this port was a centre of Mediterranean commerce. Since its economic downturn, it has been a growing lifeline for the Greek nation. I'm going to find out about a new push to expand and upgrade its facilities, including a recent 500 million euro Chinese investment. Piraeus, the port of Athens, Greece. Throughout history, its fortunes have ebbed and flowed, and the vestiges of an earlier heyday can still be seen. At the turn of the 19th century, Greek merchants began to export Russian grain across the Black Sea to feed the industrialization of Western Europe. It led to the creation of immensely powerful shipping families with world-famous names such as Aristotle Onassis. And over the last decade, Piraeus has flourished again, growing to become one of Europe's 10 biggest ports. I want to find out how this was achieved. Tassos Vambakidis is commercial manager here. Well, we are famous that the vessels are not on anchor. Okay. The vessel comes immediately birth and uh, then loading and discharging. They have uh, several hatches, so one crane can load, one crane can discharge. Where do the goods go? Well, they have three options. Sea to sea, so the charge here, another vessel comes and takes it. Sea to land, trucks deliver the cargo in, in uh, Greece or going to Central Europe. The efficiency with which large quantities of goods can be loaded and unloaded, bound for Europe, gives it a tremendous advantage. But it wasn't always like this. What was this whole port area like, I don't know, 30, 40 years ago? Right, you presume I'm old enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, there was no commercial activity here. Yeah? Two years ago, there was sea here. <laughs> Two years ago, not 30? <laughs> wow. What do you think the local Greeks think about having a massive new port in their city? In the very beginning, because this is a Chinese investment, they thought and they would bring thousands of Chinese working here. Through the years, it has been proved that uh, it's only five, six members of the, of the board of directors. All the rest, 1,400 people. We are Greeks. Piraeus port embodies the deep link that Greeks have to seafaring. But what few people know is that shipping played a surprising role in the nation's ancient temples. Stone columns are icons of the country's long history. But it's thought that the skills of Greek masonry 
were first honed by shipwrights. Southwest of Athens lies the Peloponnese Peninsula, seat of the ancient Corinthians. Now they soon realized that they could use their tools of shipbuilding to work the porous limestone of their native land. This, of course, was an important step in the Greeks being able to build beautiful stone monuments like the Temple of Apollo behind me. And they, of course, influenced architecture and ideas across Europe to America and beyond. It's a fascinating example of an unexpected link between seafaring and the spread of new ideas. Once released on the world's oceans, there's no telling where those ideas will wash up and evolve into something else. But there's another commodity in this rugged countryside that has travelled across the globe. People here have been making olive oil for more than 2,000 years. Over half of Greece's supply comes from this region. I'm heading to an olive grove on the Peloponnese Peninsula's western tip, near the town of Ermioli, to meet a man who's marketing this age-old product to brand new customers. We hold it with your hand, and you can do it cut there. it over here. Yes. There we Perfect. are. Perfect. How old is this tree? How long has this place been here? Let me ask it. Uh, how old are you? Oh, it says <laughs> <laughs> approximately 60 years old. Do they learn to speak quite young, or does it take a long time? Uh, it takes you a lot of time to learn <laughs> how to understand them. After the Greek financial crisis, Kostas Balafas saw an opportunity to bring his multinational marketing experience to his family's olive grove. In 2011, I was fired, and I was starting to consider my alternative option for the future. Why not try to bottle our product and trade it all around the world? But Kostas has his sights set on one market in particular. Why did you want to start selling to China? Definitely because it's a great market. It's a huge market. It's not easy to convince people to change their habits. Chinese people, uh, they're very familiar in using uh, soya oil or sesame oil or peanuts oil. If we can make them think how they can use it along with their cuisine, mm. I think that they will fall in love with the olive oil. Four or five kilograms of olives go into making a single litre of oil. Which is then filtered and stored at room temperature to prevent it turning acidic. Then it's ready for bottling. along the very same route I've travelled, back to China. There we are, just enough. Last one. Yes, this is the last. Right, bye. See you. <laughs> Have a nice trip to China. Enjoy. <laughs> so. Yes. I've travelled along the old shipping routes, linking China through Southeast Asia and the Middle East, onto Africa and Europe, exploring how maritime trade continues to transform lives. See you. <laughs> Have a nice trip. And now I'm going from Greece back to China to get to the very heart of why all this maritime trade actually happens. After a journey of 8,000 kilometers, Kostas's olive oil arrives in the city of Nanjing. And this 
this is where it ends up, where most of us experience the benefits of global trade and neighborhood markets. Here, we've got pasta from Italy, we've got seaweed from Korea, there's some hot sauce from Thailand, and they've even got our very own olive oil. At the time of the Great Fleet, Chinese merchants were also offering their customers goods from Asia, from Africa, and from Europe. But I think that our Admiral Zheng He would have been somewhat taken aback by the sheer variety of goods that are on offer. The liquid gold from the family olive grove might just change Chinese eating habits. Everything I've found on my journey can perhaps be boiled down to the story of this bottle of Greek olive oil. How the world's oceans set the stage for an age-old exchange carried on the backs of ships, linking distant lands, and binding together a multitude of lives, all for the fulfillment of our human desire for goods, whether exotic or mundane. My journey in the wake of Admiral Zheng He and his great fleet has brought me back to Nanjing, where it all began sailing to over 30 countries, the distance they traveled was enough to circumnavigate the globe. After 28 years, his journey ended here. The 28 stone steps leading here are said to represent the 28 years of Zhang He's naval career from 1405 to 1433. And they're further divided into four sections of seven to symbolize the seven great voyages that he led. And at the top is his tomb, a lofty resting place for a trusted servant of the Ming court. Apart from one thing, Zheng He wasn't actually buried here. He never returned from his seventh voyage. In 1433, aged 62 years old, he was in failing health as he sailed home southeast from India and somewhere in the vastness of the Indian Ocean, he died aboard ship. <laughs> 